Look at that dog. Look at that big white wolf. Hey, buddy. No, he's like, I don't want to play. Your, your, your dog is scared of, of, of things you're playing, Justin. Yes, things you're playing. All right. Well, fellas, did you miss us? We're back. Welcome to season two, episode 15 of Better Than Broadway. We've got a great show for you guys today. Before we introduce our guest, Chef Metsy, how are you guys feeling today? Mm. It is so good to be back. I see. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in like two seasons. Ryan, I was just talking about how much you've grown. I see your beard's coming in nicely. Oh, oh, here we go. Love it. Just already <laughs> shots it. fired right out of the gate. Shots fired mm. right out of the gate. Uh, I mean, my what well, I mean, my traps after unloading all these rocks today look, feel as big as yours look. So <laughs> I, know. I literally rushed here from um. I literally rushed here from the gym to training people and then getting a little bit of a pump in myself. Cause you know, you gotta look good. You gotta look good in the, in the, you gotta, it's like, what do they call it? It's a uh, skies out or traps. out. Sun's out, guns out. Don't, guns um, out, guns out. What, what is it? Uh, don't try and get by or you'll be trapped and dealt with. Oh go. my Lord. Okay. That that's, was that's... fantastic. All right, so so fantastic oh, that God. our guest today is laughing, probably at you, not with you. I'm but... editing that out. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. Hey, don't edit it out. That is directly from our Lord and Savior, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Thank you. Very okay. Much. So yeah, I thought exactly. that might have been a Ronnie Coleman quote, but Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. We can we can deal with The Rock, and and, and you know, this is a wrestling podcast, so that's even that's even better that we uh, we're using The Rock. But boys, please help me welcome uh canadian author co-founder of slamwrestling.net and all around rad dude mr greg oliver yay welcome welcome greg. to the show there eh? welcome to the show sir uh rad i don't think that's usually a word to get described to me so thank you yes uh just just welcome to the show we i don't need to do a canadian impression or anything like that greg I thank you like, for your time i feel <laughs> like we need to like greg is is that in in your opinion being an, an actual you know canadian is that something that like real canadians like oh that's stupid or is there some truth to it or are there certain points in in the country where they do talk like that and there's other points kind of like here like if you're in the south like they got little southern toying and stuff like that but then people up in the north are like come on is it like that or how would you say uh no there's definitely some truth to the the, the a and the apologizing for everything and things like that but the fact is that you know the people out in the Maritimes have more in common with Maine and and you know those kind of places, and the people in Alberta have more in common with you know Montana and stuff than they do with the people in Ontario, where I am in Toronto. So it's like it's just a big ass country. I mean, it's bigger than the U.S., just a yeah. hell of a lot less people, so a lot more well, space. What's interesting, I was in a trivia years ago, and actually they were talking about like what uh, what country um, has the most uh landmass uh of per mile so like what how much of the countries actually have the most mileage that touch the ocean and everyone's thinking like oh it's got to be australia but no it's canada because canada has so many islands yep so it is a oh, giant yeah. country and that three oceans yeah. Yeah. i would think uh, africa i would think africa but i guess that i mean yeah that's, that's a continent not a not a country yeah, yeah. well <laughs> that's yeah that's oh so you're saying just countries themselves yeah, oh right. i got you i got you yeah yeah well, because yeah, Australia is as well, but huh, that's interesting. So, where do you actually reside at now? I'm in Toronto, which uh, Canadians consider, or those of us in Toronto consider, the center of the universe. So, <laughs> well, hey, the the Maple Leafs well, are doing pretty well yeah, in yeah, the playoffs. Yeah. You're like I, a Canadian New Yorker. We're not allowed yeah. to say anything about the Leafs because yes, they they let us down every year. My son is 16 and has never seen them win a playoff game or playoff series. So, oh, wow, it's uh, this might be the night tonight. Let's go. Fingers crossed. Well, well uh, New York, like like Toronto is straight above New York, correct? The the Western New York, for sure. So yes. Buffalo, Buffalo is about an hour and a half on a good right. drive. Well, then Toronto is often used as a double of New York with a lot of, uh, you know, movie filming because um, it has such a big met uh, metropolis city that they can, and it's so much cheaper. It's not just the cheap, it's also the, they've built a really good film industry, both here and in, in Vancouver, especially. Um, and you're right, there are some cost advantages to coming up here, but they also have the talented people that can make it happen. Mm -hmm. That That's a big part of it. Um, yeah, no, I have a lot of friends that are in the film industry. 
and uh, in do, fact, do you think yeah. it's like do you think it's like Atlanta to where like you know it started out as because it was cheaper but then because of that a lot of people started moving to Atlanta so then the talent came with that and so now I believe Atlanta's kind of that same way do you think that was the same case with Toronto I think it's always been the case in fact I mean jumping ahead a little bit I did a, a book about an actor a biography called Billy Van and um, the actor's name Billy Van and he was on Sonny and Cher and did a couple of U.S. shows um, but he just loved living in Toronto so much that he left Hollywood and moved back home and then he would occasionally go down and do things there and so because you had the basis of people that loved Toronto, uh, there's a good basis of, of actors and always have been. Uh, and it is a great place to stand in for New York City or wherever you want to be. Um, it, it, it's a very multicultural city uh, and, and it's easy to, to switch it over to make it look like something else for sure. How often are you in the States now? Like, do you travel here fairly often or has it been a long time? Is it just once in a blue moon? Well, pre-pandemic, yeah, it, I, I would be there on a couple of times a year. Um, I go every year to the Cauliflower Alley Club, which I would encourage any wrestling fan should be somebody that, um, it's something they should be supporting and be a part of because it's essentially the Alumni Association of Professional Wrestling. And having written about sports for a while now too, you understand that there are, Alumni associations and the leagues actually look out for players uh, post-career, whereas in pro wrestling, there's none of that, right? If you're not with WWE, they don't care. You know, they may put you in drug rehab to make themselves look good half the reason. Um, but the Polish Rally Club is really important for us to support. And it's down in Vegas every year. And I go down there and that's usually my one big trip. Um, and my, my brother and family lives in... Um, Palm Springs. So I get to see them too on the same trip. So that's fantastic. So my follow up, I asked that question because you kind of touched on it is um, I follow a lot of bodybuilders, right? I, I love bodybuilding in addition to pro wrestling. And, you know, there's a lot of really kind of like high level or, or just there's a lot of um, big name, uh, popular bodybuilders that live up in Canada. And I listen to and one of my favorite podcasts is um, by Fuad Abiyad and he, uh, he owns Hostile and they own the he does a bro chat podcast and bodybuildings and bullocks and all this other kind of stuff. But quite a few of the guys are in Canada and their main complaint for Canada is just, they're still very strict because of the, um, I think we're supposed to say virus or whatever. Right. Um, is it, is that, is that true? Is it more difficult? Like have, have you guys still recently had lockdowns or how long has it been since you've had one? Um, is it harder to get out of the country now than perhaps, you know, pre before or, um, no, I think seem pretty normal these days. Uh, it can be hit and miss, but that's the same at any border, right? Like mm -hmm. you get the wrong guy and you say the wrong thing, all of a sudden you find yourself being que you know questioned. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've read stories where people, you know, all of a sudden the border guard asked, you know, can you show me your vaccination record? It's like, well, I didn't think we needed that these days. And then others will just let you go through without an issue. And mm -hmm. that, that's just the nature of the border. And I understand that they're doing their job. But yeah, things are by and large here. I mean, you see, see people wearing masks. Uh, it's not like um, in the U.S. I, when I was working on the one book down in Texas, I was putting my mask in the, on to go into the restaurant. And John Gibbons turns to me and goes, this is Texas, man. They're going to shoot you if you're wearing your mask. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, what are you wearing that mask for? <laughs> yeah. well, it is it is a stark contrast. You know, I don't we don't allow any I do uh, security uh, for a, a jewelry store. Um, that we got a contract for right now and um i don't let anybody in the place that has a mask on well because you can't Whereas see their the face for the camera well, exactly well exactly. yeah you just smash and grabs and stuff like that so you have to buzz them in but what's funny is a couple of years ago is you couldn't let anybody in if they didn't have a mask on so it's right. just it's right. kind of funny the way it works um all right you well know, so that's um, enough to talk about that rob what do you got in in, in talks of what <laughs> you're trying to ask questions you know, Greg, you know, Greg, I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, John Gibbons, uh, because you actually it's been a really big year for you so far. Two of your books have been released. One about Gibby uh, is the uh, the memoir of John Gibbons, the uh, manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, uh, two time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, and also uh, the uh, the woman who would be king uh medusa michelli deborah michelli also known as alundra blaze to the uh, wwe fans uh big name in the awa big name in wcw and now uh she is a uh a monster truck driver 
Um, just uh, congratulations, first off, on your success this year and in the past. But uh, I'd love to I'd love to touch on uh, Medusa briefly and uh, what your experience is with her. And uh, Paul Heyman actually wrote the foreword to her book. And I was wondering if you had any um, experience with him, if you had a chance to speak with him when the book was being uh, published and written. Um, Greg, please. Uh, that's a lot to unpack. Yeah, no, it's been a wonderful year. I've been very fortunate. I wouldn't recommend anybody work on two front level books like that at the same time. But I did. They were very different people. John Gibbons was a very laid back Texan kind of guy. Uh, and um, Deb Medusa, I described sort of as like working with a hurricane. Um, she, her mind goes a thousand miles a minute or kilometers in in the real world. The U.S. is still using the backwards. Uh, <laughs> well, 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 I saw something the other day that said something happened or an, an alligator found roughly the size of Ariana Grande. And I was like, the U.S. will use any type of system to measure something except for the metric system. Exactly. Like, yes, it's so weird. Um, and then Deb, yeah, it's like dealing with a hurricane. She can't always focus. She's a bit... ADHD and and I love her to death but yeah it's just it could be all over the map when you were talking to her mm -hmm. uh, and it was a wonderful experience she's had a lot of trauma in her life a lot of chaos uh definitely not an easy road um wrestling she actually did wrestling less than she did monster trucks and she doesn't drive monster trucks anymore she's uh, just turned 60 and her body's a little bit beaten up and and the monster trucks are actually probably harder on the body than the pro wrestling which was crazy to learn about yeah. there's never been a book for adults um about monster truck driving about the behind the scenes which was remarkable when i was going through all the research so a lot of the stuff that's in there is really new to people like learning about how whatever company was running monster trucks and monster jam how that all worked and how bigfoot you know was a separate company and she got mm. hired by them to drive and uh, it, it was fascinating to learn all that um but well i mean that makes that makes sense because like i know like f1 drivers like when you're flying around like at you know you gun it like your body is taking a lot of just g-force and so i can imagine if you're you know hit the 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 power on the monster trucks and that it, jolting i mean yeah that mess you it's, up it's not just that it's that they go there to wreck i mean yeah. that's that's the whole point of it you know and so i and i you guys don't know this but i know a little bit about monster trucks just because my uncle built and 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 drove them and and raced them so growing up we had a family monster truck it was called hog runner um he didn't go on the monster jam circuit or whatever but it was 11 inches taller than bigfoot it was largely a show vehicle but just learning how these things are steered and and driven it's completely different from a normal vehicle and I, you, I'm, john you can probably say way more than me so i'm not going to try and act like i do know i just i had i was very into it being from florida um there was a lot of it there and then just the fact that my uncle was really into it and i got to watch him build one from the ground up it blew my mind at you know eight years old well the parallels to wrestling were fascinating because like your your uncle would have been an independent Right. So you have, you know, Feld running Monster Jam, this great big WWE like company. Then there's all these independents and they would occasionally bring in independents to work on those Monster Jam shows and and, you know, fill a slot or whatever. But the indie guys would have to pay for their truck. The Feld guys, when the truck got destroyed, it was OK because it was in house so they could fix it that way. So, again, the parallels to wrestling were there. And, and because Medusa was there so early as as Monster Jam grew we we dealt with a lot of the um improvements that came along over the years with the uh, better safety measures like things like that when they started they didn't even have like the the neck holders right things like that so they were really bouncing around and and she talks about how you can't find any of those videos online anymore of them oh. really shaking around like they've just totally taken them all away for osha is like no <laughs> yeah this didn't happen you know yeah back, back when my happened. uncle i remember back when he was doing it a lot of them didn't even have full cages they were basically vehicles that they would build a cage in and now they're literally just a cage that they put you know like nascar they just put fiberglass on top of it but like his had i mean this was this was in the early 80s and so he, you know his just had like a little cage that he built around it like wh when did they start do you did you dive when you did this stuff with medusa did you dive deep enough in to kind of like learn the history of it and like and all that i, I did i did to a degree yeah because you have to figure like 
she was the first woman driver for Monster Jam. Yeah. She was not the first woman driver because really it was the guy who um, it was Bigfoot's wife who drove the truck. So, you know, <laughs> if you start with the first monster truck and you just go from there. Um, but yeah, just the, the changes that change, like she fought for so much being the first woman, you know, getting a dressing room, getting other female, uh, finally a female crew chief. Uh, the, the clothing, right, wasn't made to fit her boobs. Like things like that, you don't even think about the harnesses yeah. didn't get her boobs. And back then she still had those great artificial ones that she had coming out of WCW. <laughs> so there was all these things that, again, it, it challenged me as a book because partly because I'm a man. So you have to think about all those things and the boob jobs are good examples. Like, so all of a sudden you're learning about miscarriages and, and boob jobs and nose jobs and, and all the other issues that go on. So there's, there's one story in there. She talks about being in the ring in a white outfit and menstruating. It's like, would I have asked that question? No, but she has no fear. She has no filter. She just tells stories. And we have to decide what to put in and what not to. And it's so it's so interesting, too, with Medusa kind of being the unofficial, you know, first lady of wrestling, especially in the 80s and 90s. And the parallels between monster truck and wrestling, I, I, I really, I, I did not know all these things and it's 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 so interesting to see the parallels between monster truck and wrestling so thank you for that wonderful insight greg um i'd like to talk a little bit about um about slam wrestling uh you are the uh the co-founder and co-owner of slam wrestling.net which is uh one of the biggest if not the biggest uh pro wrestling uh news media website and i like to use news media because you are a journalist, you are a sports journalist, as was Bobby the Brain Heenan. He was a he was a broadcast journalist. So uh, taking taking into account the fact that you are a parent, you are a husband, you are a sports writer, you are a, a book writer, a novelist, and you own this many many all these hats. Um, you said that you don't watch a lot of the current product uh, in our in our pre interview. Uh, thing which is perfectly fine because there's a lot of good stuff going on a lot of not so good stuff going on wrestling these days but being that you uh, own slam wrestling.net um how does that how does that keep you um involved and, and fresh with what's going on in the uh in the uh sports entertainment universe uh before i say that i will say when you say bobby the brain heenan one of the greatest compliments I ever got was bobby the brain heenan telling me that he kept our pro wrestling hall of fame the tag teams books in his toy in his bathroom so he could read it when he was on the can oh so that's fantastic like that that's beautiful that's awesome um, the uh slam wrestling's been around since 1996 it, it came out of the the toronto sun newspaper chain uh and and grew from there and so you know there were just so many opportunities to do things over the years and that we happened to start off right as the Attitude Era was was starting to really take off. There was a Toronto WWF office at the time, so we got access to a lot more wrestlers and 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 interviews than than most places would get, and it grew from there. Right, we just kept building and building, and unlike so many sites, I like to think we have a brain, and you know we built it in a way that it's um archived right so we talked about the rock briefly earlier well i interviewed the rock in late 1996 so that interview is still available and and his mom tells me that was the first ever wrestling interview he did and <laughs> that's amazing you know that that's just really cool and, and so slam is like that but we're real journalists so i like to think we also put some thought into the greater process which is the archive which is some interlinking which is you know, sharing, oh, if I've got this story, while well, I remember we did this story, you know, 13 years ago, let's make sure we link to it. Uh, and and I love that aspect of it, because it's not just about today's wrestling. And, and sure, I don't watch a lot, but we cover most of the shows. I have people that are enthusiastic, whether it's about MLW or the NWA or uh, WWF, whatever it may be, they they're, they just love watching and it's great and that they get the chance to cover it on a regular basis for us. And um, I'm I'm happy to have so many great people working with me, and um, I end up being a little bit of a mentor because some of these people writing for me are, you know, could be my kids, uh, and and that's okay. 
and and if you make them better writers and maybe they stop writing for you and get a job at a newspaper or something else that's cool too but Greg, isn't that kind of the, the the dream of owning a business to where like you build something and then basically you could walk away for a day and it runs completely smoothly? Yeah, it is part of the dream. And and there's three of us, Bob Kapoor and John Powell and I, that are sort of the three key guys. And we try to keep each other abreast about who's around, right? Because there's new stuff that breaks. I mean, I'm generally in charge of doing the, the stories. So if somebody's interviewing Vert Vixen or... You know, we have an interview with Adam Cole or whoever it is, right? It, right, right. it goes through me and gets edited. Um, then John is mainly in charge of the TV aspect and making sure that all the different shows are covered. It, it, it's it's a good team effort for sure. And you're right. It is a nice process, especially with WordPress, because we used to be on when we were part of Sun Media, Post Media, we had a proprietary publishing system. And that was in-house and it wasn't nearly as good as WordPress and, and the ability to be able to switch things around and run them when we want and all these things now is, is truly terrific. And it makes me wonder why we never got a chance to do that all those years ago. What you were talking about, you know, obviously taking a step back and things like that, but you're still involved with the company itself. Was that something that was just out of necessity for you for all these other projects that you wanted to do? And it was just like, if I have to let go of something, if I'm going to grab something else, or is it more of like, a, you know, I think it's time for me to move on. And then you figured out what you wanted to do next. Uh, there's a large variety there. I, it's never been, slime wrestling has never been my full-time job, right? Yeah. Like I haven't had a full-time job since 2001, uh, you know, I got laid off from that. They brought me back to work part-time on slam wrestling. And then I did some book things. I've laid out a ton of books. I've written books. Um, I've done all kinds of different jobs over the years, but the best job was just raising my son, right? He was born in 2006. My wife had a good job. She still has a good job. So she's out there uh, working and, and I love her for that. Um, and I was able to raise my son and now he's 16 and bigger than me and tougher than me and all that. And what are you going to do? Uh, he, there were times he got into wrestling or he got into hockey or whatever it is. And it just, it ebbs and flows, right? Kids are going to find their different interests. And, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, wrestling's never been full-time for me um, on anything. And I don't think I would want it to be because it's, it's such a weird business that you feel sort of icky um, spending too much time around it sometimes, especially when you know the behind the scenes thing, right. And how really awful it is. Yeah. And also when something's a passion project for you, when you love it, it's, it's almost, it almost doesn't feel right. And you can get burnt out if you make it a full-time thing, or if you push it or something like that, you know, I, you know, it's, what do they say? It's like, if, if you truly want to like hate something, turn it, you know, your passion, turn it into a job. They're always like, Oh, we'll do something you love, blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, I got into fitness because I love fitness and then I turned it into a full-time job and I, I got out of it for a long time because I got sick of it. Um, so, I mean, I could imagine that it would probably be the same thing. So it's probably, it's probably fairly smart on, you, you know, on your part to, to have that foresight to be like, let me keep enjoying this by not overloading myself with it. Well, you, you, you don't want to lose the fun out of it, you know, and that's, yeah. you know, with fitness, with pro wrestling, it's with, you know, martial arts with anything is that once, you know, you start regretting like, ah, oh, yeah, I gotta go do this. It's like, you start, it starts just chipping away a little bit by little bit um and there, there's a fine balance and you know that's why people invented vacations <laughs> this, one, this is why i go this is why i go out of town you know about once a month just to reset my brain because i watch pretty much all the wrestling shows because obviously we have a podcast and you know i'm in the gym coaching you know sometimes 12 hours a day so yeah it's like you know the end of the month i'm just like get me out of here you usually go down to savannah right I'll go to Savannah. I'm going to go home to Savannah Mother's Day, and then I'm going to go to uh, Florida for a few days for a weightlifting competition. But I'm going to stay a few days after that. I'll go to Colorado this summer. I'm going to stay a few days after that. Go hike, be in nature. Yeah. You know, just be barefoot for a few days. You know, I mean, it's just, it's healthy. It's just that's healthy. more, hey, that's more important than people think. And I'm sorry to sound like a hippie, but grounding yourself is very important it on matters. a scientific level. Literally taking your shoe. When I say grounding, I literally mean like electrical. Take your shoes off. Yeah. stand on the dirt I'm it sure. helps it really does. speaking of a uh, grounding greg what do you do to ground yourself well i was gonna add that like i've been a scout leader for um uh, 35 years or so okay so, um 
various levels of, of ages of kids but right now i actually have scouts which are the 11 12 13 14 year olds mm -hmm. so yeah we're able to do hikes and camping and all that kind of stuff so you know it's a once a week once a week kind of reprieve where you know i'm out just hanging out with them and just in a way you're you're a kid again right yeah. yes you're the responsible adult but you, you can dumb yourself down a little bit for lack of a better way to put it yeah. and just do goofy stuff sometimes and yeah so preparing for camp i mean there's real work involved but it the rewards usually there um because you see these kids grow up you see them learn new skills uh and as i said i've been doing it forever so again being offline is awesome i, I mean you guys are in atlanta you wouldn't understand the winter camping but i just did that a, a about two months ago where you're actually you know dragging your gear across uh, frozen lakes um to go to your campsite and stuff so i mean that's a great way to recharge and i'm not taking my shoes off when you're doing that and grounding them <laughs> losing some toes yeah, in the process way. not not for very long anyways yeah don't no. would, you have to dig out a, away from the from the whatever to to get to the actual dirt because you're probably in a couple inches of snow yeah. you know it's um i would imagine that that being a uh you know a guide for that would both make you feel young and old at the same time right like there's probably there's probably aspects of like you said it makes you feel younger but at the same time you're like i feel really really old and man like 11 12 13 14 like that's that's probably the age. most important age well it's probably the most important age for a young man right i would think so like it that's the time where like you're still very much so a sponge, but now you've got hormones that are coming into play and like your entire life is kind of changing. Like that's, um, that's a pretty big responsibility. Oh, well, well, Scouts Canada has been co-ed for like at least 20 years now. So we've got, oh hey, gosh, we had, we had four or five girls uh, in the last, last year's troop. And then we have three, I think this year. And, and so that changes the dynamic too, right? Sometimes they're tomboy, sometimes they're not. Uh, and, but they're all finding their way too. And, and that's also the age where they start going to university or sorry, not university, going to high school. So there's that change too. Uh, yeah, no, I love it. Um, sometimes you find out they're, they, they find out you're a wrestling fan. They're really into it. Sometimes they don't. I ran into one of my scouts and his dad after the Toronto Blue Jays home opener with my son. So we had a good chat on the way home. So it, it's, you know, there's rewards outside of it too. Sometimes they buy books. So, you know, that's good. Too. There you go. <laughs> there is you your, is yeah. your son is your son in, in scouts is he did he eagle out or is he still involved no he 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 grew out of it yeah and he's yeah. Uh, now somehow became a jock which is completely oblivious to me and my wife it, it we didn't expect that to happen at all but you know playing all these sports um whereas my brother is a really big level coach uh he uh he was a basketball coach for canadian university but now he actually runs a program called Basketball Immersion uh, and goes around and coaches coaches. So, you know, he's going to Iceland, the coach. He was just in Australia. Um, the Denver Nuggets hired him to bring, come in and talk to their coaches. So he's a real high level coach. So he's the jock in the family and my son's following in the footsteps. That's wonderful. But is he playing hockey or, or basketball or what? Uh, it's been football. We lose John. Did we lose Greg? Oh no. I'm I'm here. Oh, no. Yeah. I think we lost him. I think we lost Greg. Oh. Let's just give it a second. Yeah. See if we need to. My heart, my heart like skipped a beat. I was like, I just put my hand on, on, on the mouse pad. Oh no. I I did too. I did too. Uh, you think that's what did it? Oh, are okay, you back? I'm back. Right? Hey, back. Hey, back. Hey, back. We're back. Okay, Greg. All right. Nobody touch anything. Don't touch anything. Yeah. <laughs> everyone put your hands up so, somebody get some aluminum foil oh, now go that like was this weird. I can see it to the coming. television I... <laughs> all right so greg i am dying more probably than anybody that we've ever had on here for you to answer these kind of like uh stock questions that we try to or mandatory i should say questions that we ask everybody that comes in um ryan do you want to do the honors of of number sure. one because i'm i feel like with as long as he's been in the sport i'm i'm really I don't know, I'm just itching to hear his answers. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, every time someone comes on, we ask, uh, who is your favorite wrestler of all time? <laughs> wow, that's a tricky one. No big um, deal, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Easy. Yeah. To, no to, to watch, it was always flair. And to get the interview, it was pretty awesome. Um, but 
you know, you develop relationships with these guys, right? And there's some that become friends and that's a whole different kind of thing. So if you're setting that aside, it was always flair as far as performer. I used to pretend to be gorgeous Jimmy Garvin um, when we were goofing around on the side of the house kind of thing. Um, so those two guys sort of stand out as being early in my wrestling fan fandom kind of thing. That's awesome. Love that. Right on. Awesome. Nature boy. So the next one, You've already kind of you, you you said a couple things here, and I and I can imagine that it, this might be even harder for you. But what is your favorite? We say like mark out moment, or just what is your favorite moment with wrestling? It could be interacting with someone that you've met, like you said, or just it it could be a moment like watching WrestleMania or something like that. But in general, what's what's the number one moment? Um, if you just th- picked one out of your head that kind of sticks in there as like, this is this is very fond for me. There's so many surreal moments, right? And it's it's partly about getting out there and going to these events like Call of Rally Club or the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame when it existed, like sitting in a bar with Jack Briscoe and his wife, Jan, and just mm-hmm. pounding them back. Like that's, or having hot dogs with Ken Patera. Um, all these kind of things, but it's surreal. It's not really, like I don't really mark out in the same way because- you try to be professional and all that kind of stuff. Um, but well, yeah, I, I guess just... here's here's a, a a better twist of the question. What was what's been the biggest, um, you know, kind of uh, payoff you you've enjoyed watch you know formulating wrestling? One of the early ones that I got was with the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, uh, the Canadians, the first book. Uh, two things I got a typewritten note so these these are kind of things that sort of made me feel like i finally belonged kind of thing right i got a typewritten note from gene kaniski uh thanking me for the book this was in 2003 but i wish i had it but there was also a message from killer kowalski and he'd called and left a message on my the old answering machine and it said greg thanks for putting me over because he was like my number three canadian of all time and it's like like that's a moment you never, you know, it, it'll stick with you forever. And and related to that was the book launch we did uh, for the Pro Wrestling Hall of Canadians, where where they all came down to um, it was Tony Parisi's old restaurant in Niagara Falls, and and you know you had Angela Mosca there and Reggie Love and uh, all these local guys that came out. It was just such a beautiful moment. Um, but then fast forward, I mean, the Cauliflower Alley Club gives you an award. I got an award in in Iowa. Um, one year at the CAC, Rick Martell insisted that I sit at his head table, you know, cause he was being honored. Like, and so you're sitting there as Jake Roberts, um, honky tonk man, buddy lane, and a couple of other guys are all doing Stu Hart impressions. Like, again, <laughs> it's it. just about being in the right place, the right time sometimes mm-hmm. and, and having earned the trust and respect. And that, that takes time. And, that's a lot of what I see wrong with today's wrestling journalism in a way. You don't go to a, you know, a, a press conference for AEW and clap. Like you it just shouldn't happen. So I don't know. That, that's a different rant. Rick Martell, man. Rick Martell, one guy who, in my estimation, had he not injured his knee, would have been world champion all damn day, especially when he went to WCW. If he hadn't gotten hurt, man, he would have – I just feel like he is the one of – I feel like he's one of three guys that, that should have been world heavyweight champion that never got his – never got his shine. He he was – he definitely had the ability to take um, what he was given and, the and kind of make the most out of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you. I'm just curious. I want to dig a little bit deeper here because you said you don't really mark out, blah, blah, blah. But was – is there ever been a time when something happens where it kind of snuck past you and you did – kind of mark out just a little bit it doesn't have to be like your favorite thing or like just something caught you off guard and you're like oh and you're like oh i'm being a little bit of a fanboy here or whatever there's got to be or are you or are you just concrete you're just stone cold <laughs> no pun intended well you, i mean you never break moments. you never break kayfabe he never smiles I mean, <laughs> let's I mean, be honest here <laughs> i mean interviewing sunny in like 1997 i mean she oh god so gorgeous <laughs> at that point i mean I and, love it. and you know, like how do you else describe it? I mean, she was absolutely stunning and yep. standing beside her, and it felt bizarre. Um, 
yeah so though there's a couple of those kind of moments where you felt really out of place maybe is a better word it's like she's actually talking to me like this is so weird was there any questions that you didn't ask her that you wanted to or any questions that you did ask her that maybe you realized oh i probably should have done that if i sound stupid uh, I've gotten a lot better at that. I think if I look back at some of those, and I wish I had some of those ones still around besides just the the written pieces. Uh, if I had the um, audio, I, I would be cringing, no doubt, at how, <laughs> what a I loser I was. Well, like, I would have been like, you, you, I would have been like Chris right? Farley. I would have been like Chris Farley. I would have been like, so, you know, you know that one time when you like, when you <laughs> came out with Shawn Michaels? Uh, yeah. That, that was cool <laughs> <laughs> you wore that dress one time how did how, how was that <laughs> like that's what we I did off the back for you yeah okay. oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh what, but then wait, you what, fast forward a bit and then you have to ask those kind of questions of medusa right like you're you're getting to the very depths of everything they've done in their life so you, you you've lost all that fear and you build that trust with her so you can ask those questions. And and my rule with when you're working on an autobiography is tell me everything. We don't have to put everything in. Right. Right. Like you walk stuff back. And, and we did that with the John Gibbons book. We certainly did that with Medusa. Like there's stuff that could have been in there that we took back. And, and that's just part of the process, really. Well, that's part of being a professional journalist. I'll tell you, that's that's really cool, because I think in this day and age, there's probably not a lot of people that are willing to do that. It's like, hey, tell me everything and then get the juicy stuff and just use it for clickbait as opposed to, you know, being respectful to the people's, you know, desires of privacy or, or anonymity, whatever it may be. Um, so kind of the last question that we typically ask somebody, and this is this is kind of the, this might be the hardest one for you is, what is your favorite match? Like your favorite moment actually in wrestling, like if you're watching you had to pick like you know like flare versus steam or you know like whatever you know the um the one i i've been able to tell i think three or four of them that how much i enjoyed it was it was a great american bash tour 1998 they were in kobo arena and it was the midnight express um so oh. it was uh yeah it was stan and bobby at that point um against tully and arn with J.J. Dillon and so all I, I've been able to tell Corny that I know I told um, Tully that and I know I've told J.J. Uh, Dillon that uh, I'm just trying to think uh, like there there were moments I met Arn and I've I've I never, never met Stan and I did meet Bobby I think but yeah so you'll be able to tell these guys in person that that's a match that really means something and it was just a house card show right like you know it just was one that resonated me just as being one of the funnest things I ever saw in my life. Man, it was what you said, 88? It was 88, I think. Maybe 87. Great American Bash. Yeah, see, boy, yeah boy. So, so the two big ones, 86 and 88, I think, are the two. Yeah, but it, it was a house show, right? So they did a tour. Oh, okay. okay. Right? So they, you know, and I, it was just also, I, I think I organized a bus trip with my, because I used to do a newsletter uh, called the Canadian Wrestling Report from 85 to 90. And I organized that a bus to where we had a couple of um vans that we all drove down to the show in detroit from um around toronto and kitchener which is where i lived which is about an hour from toronto well you know it's interesting because you know ontario canada canada is known for wrestling the the hart family you know stampede wrestling but you know it's interesting to me especially in this millennium the 2000s and now these last 23 years Ontario has been especially Toronto has become really the big hotbed you know for wrestling uh I know you did a documentary in 2017 with uh Sweet Daddy Siki who um were the train was the trainer for Edge and Christian and you know you think about guys like Lance Storm you think about guys like Cody Diener who's in Impact Wrestling now and Sin Bodhi um looking at test you know uh, uh rest in peace looking at the landscape of wrestling in the last you know 35 years since you've been a, a sports journalist um what do you think is going to be the long-term legacy of toronto professional wrestling hmm that's a good question i mean the legacy is already there i mean we had world champions dating back to the you know 1930s you got your whipper billy watson she had 
famous oh, yeah. title changes here with your Luthez and and Buddy Rogers title change took place in Toronto. Um, Terry Funk and, and Harley Race had a title switch here. Uh, and then years later, you get your WrestleManias and all that kind of stuff. I think what works in Toronto, though, is that it's such a metropolitan and very multicultural place that the wrestlers that come out of here, by and large, are also different, right? And I think that's, a, a, there, there's nobody homogeneous, right? You got Hornet, who's like one of the referees. Daryl Schwarm is one of the referees on NXT. And then you've got, you know, your Edge, your Christians. You've got um, Cherry Bomb, who's uh, the bunny. Uh, you I'm know, she's yeah. from Toronto. You know, so there's hmm. just so many different people that have come out of here or trained here or new people who trained here. And and really, you're talking the greater Toronto area, which goes down to sort of Niagara Falls and stuff. So, yeah, you can you get guys like Diener and Ethan Page and all those guys, too. Scott um, the there's Moore's a lot of impact. opportunities. Yeah. Scott the Moore's running impact now. Yeah, yeah, and I've known and, and Scott what, and, and what's his name? Uh, uh, Morella, Santino Morella. He's also from <laughs> that area. He's got a uh, kickboxing school. Is that correct? That was judo. 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 So, yeah, he can kick my ass. Only I, We're not really talking about new stuff right now, but I feel like it's important and big enough to mention just because you said impact. Um, Trinity, this is kind of a big deal, right? Yeah, Trinity, Naomi. a.k.a. Na Naomi, is making her debut – this upcoming week for impact so she assigned with impact that is massive for impact um i think it's probably not exactly what she was hoping for unless maybe she's just wanting to get some banger matches in because the impact women's division or the knockouts division is is fantastic some of the best Absolutely. there is but um I don't know. I, I don't know if you've heard about that or not. Oh, yeah, uh, no, I did. Greg. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I follow along. Certainly, we have a lot of the stuff on the site, and I, I respect it. But, yeah, I think you're right that she probably thought something else would have happened by now. And this is not settling by any means. Like you said, they have a very good women's division. Uh, it's, and... it's settling financially, right? And that's oh, the question is, does she not need – because there's no way that Impact is going to be able to pay as much as a WWE or even an AEW. And then you have Mercedes Monet went over to New Japan. She's obviously making big waves over there. She was apparently at the taping from what I understand. Um, so I don't that's know if there's picture, some type yeah. of forbidden door going on between them. You know, they've done a lot of stuff already and like Bullet Club and everything else. But I just wanted to know your opinion on that. Do you think that that is – what do you think her geez, pun, impact is going to be with that? Do you think that's going to change the roster or change the landscape? Or do you think she's ultimately just going to kind of come there and pull like a Drew McIntyre and end up back in WWE? I think that's probably the the long-term goal. But the fact is she's got to get her reps in. You, you said that, right? You got to get out there. You got to wrestle. Uh, she's going to get better as a wrestler. She was never somebody we saw in WWE that said, oh, she's the greatest wrestler ever. So I think her getting in there and being challenged uh, with your Diona Perozas and all them, it's really going to help her. Well, uh, I think it's one of those things where, you know, you, you suffer a little bit of a defeat and it's only going to make you come back stronger. So, yeah, absolutely. There's some drive there for sure. Uh, and that's a good, that's a good example. And, and the, by and large, everybody likes being in the impact locker room from everything I understand, right. They run a good show. Um, everybody's sort of a bit of a tight knit unit and they're all being used. Unlike say EW where there's guys you don't see for two months. Yeah. Miro for instance. Yeah. Lance Archer. Um, God, we could just keep going. Well, I'm sorry. He actually, Archer is on an independent show. Uh, I saw it come through like when I, my fight TV subscription. That's yeah. the one thing that they're letting them go out and do other things if they want yeah. to. But, you know, I think, you know, this new show that they've got going on that apparently CM Punk is going to headline Collision. Um, I think, I, I don't think, I hope that that's going to give these people um, the screen time and we're going to see the people like like the Miros and stuff like that kind of come up and shine and maybe finally get some stuff because Miro, they just, I can't think of a, of a bigger ball drop than that. Um, he just had so much momentum coming in. That's it's, that's like Bret Hart to WCW, you know. Like <laughs> it's just like, I mean, that much of a like, oh, it was so hot, and then just nothing, you know. I mean, I would love to see you know like Miro versus Wardlow. Like that would be an amazing match. Yes. Um, he could, yeah, he could absolutely pull a pull a really good match out of Wardlow. I think, I think that would work. You know, just two big old beefy boys. Banging, beating chests. 
banging. It's two boys banging. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan. It's a different show. <laughs> yeah. No, that's oh no, it's, it's this show, show every week. <laughs> it's this show, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> The family um, show boys it's family yeah show. family show it's, it's family show yeah my dog's here guys come on my daughter's here <laughs> come on guys she's a, yeah <laughs> this is my daughter this is my fur baby oh. hello my son's here too would you like you want some mac and cheese yes you can have mac and cheese if you like yes absolutely yeah. um <laughs> i'm sorry i got distracted where were we at guys updating oh man here we go um, real, real quick, Greg, you you're talking. You mentioned something uh, about the the what stuck out my head. People aren't clapping at an AEW press conference. Will you talk more about your feelings behind that? And, yeah. and just not not AEW specifically, but that feeling in general. Yeah, well, what you end up with in wrestling, especially, are okay. There's a famous book called "No Cheering in the Press Box" by Jerome Holtzman. And it talks a lot about, I think it came out in the 50s, maybe the 60s, but it's a lot about, you know, a little bit about ethics and about what you're supposed to be like as a journalist. And you get so many of these fanboys and fanboys just being a general term, because obviously there's fangirls and fan non-binaries and whatever, but they aren't trained journalists. And all of a sudden they're thrust in these roles backstage where they're still fanboys. And there needs to be that, distance right you can't mm -hmm. be um you know worshiping these people and write about them impartially and there's going to be times you piss people off there's going to be times where you um make a decision to run a story that's going to upset other people uh, or maybe there isn't and then don't call yourself a journalist and so yeah there are times you go to these events and there's applauding um you know and, and cheering and stuff it's like again no cheering in the press box it sounds you know, like there's just a, a a bit of a lack of professionalism you know going yeah, on exactly. you're not well, supposed to know the clothes you're not you know, supposed you to know the stripper's up. real name uh, right? the strip don't don't do oh, the man. stripper's real name <laughs> um how, how what do you think has has created that you think youtube has created that with all these oh 100 that are just tiktok i mean basically like we're we're that right we're not journalists we're just fans that you know that that wanted to start a podcast um so and i'm sure that there's a lot do you think that that's the main reason i mean does it frustrate you you know being you know kind of putting so much time and effort into this over these last three and a half decades to see that and these people because there's a lot of people that are like that i know what you're talking about and they're at a really high level now um yeah you know would that be considered I don't know if it would be considered hating or what, but like, I understand what you're saying with, because like, it's, it's kind of like that with all media now, right? Like there's so much media, there's so much quote unquote journalism that's biased one way or the other. It's kind of hard to sift through all the crap. Um, well, and that's just the way the world exploded. Right. And the ability of anybody to put anything out there has ruined um, what is journalism and, and taken it away. It's also flattened it. And, and there's some good to that too, right? So your citizen reporters are actually out there maybe revealing things that wouldn't have been revealed before, but they also may not know how to do it, or they may, as as we sort of alluded to, right? If you're giving away the secrets and, and things that aren't supposed to be told, um, and, and that could hurt somebody, like that's also a journalist decision, right? It's like, you know, I, I'm not going to put the name of the kid in the story because he's underage. Or she's yep. underage, right? Like there's, and if you're not trained to understand that, you can really hurt and, and really be detrimental to somebody's life. Um, yeah, it's, it's a weird business these days. Uh, I still get a daily newspaper and, and I know there's not a lot of people that still do. And that frustrates me because the thing is that people used to know a little about a lot of different things right? Because you got your newspaper, you watched your daily news. Now what's happened is people have chosen because of what's out there, they can find their niche. Now they know a lot about a little. And it's it's a fundamental changing of the way society is now. And, and that's just really unfortunate. Um, and I think we're a weaker society in general because of it. Greg, have you seen the movie Idiocracy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the first two minutes of that movie. It's, it's no longer mind blowing. 
they've changed it's it a documentary. Now. When you go, it's a documentary. When you, yeah, when you go look for it, it's no longer in the fiction category. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. God. Ne- neither is George Orwell stuff. So that's also true. <laughs> Well, man, but, but, this I, this is awesome. I I could I could listen to because this this is a deep conversation. I don't know if we want to go more into this or not. I don't know how comfortable you are about it, um, because we are getting a little bit, I would say, like quasi political about it. But um, it, it is an interesting thing, and it does both. There's goods and, and bads in it. Do you have any? Have you thought about it yourself of how this can be rectified or improved, or the things that maybe? you know, we could do because like, there's really no certification or there's really no, at least not that I'm aware of to like put a stamp on something and be like, yeah, this is approved. And at this point, if somebody came up with that or made up with that, people would just be like, well, you just made that up. So like, there's not, because everybody has an iPhone and everybody has access to the internet. Any asshole with an opinion can be a journalist. Yeah, exactly. The the right. cat's out of the bag. There's no way to ever put this back. It's um, Pandora's box, right? yeah exactly it's it's just it's a changed world and we have to accept that and we have to educate our kids on how to recognize what is legitimate and what isn't and that's really hard because a lot of adults don't know well i think a lot of it is the the professionals need to start throwing down the professionalism like or not professionalism their ability of like asking the better questions getting the attention of you know, the people who are answering the questions versus the bowl, the, of the BS questions, you know, no, n- the cream's got to rise to the top when it comes to these, uh, the interviewers. And I think, you know, there we go. I, I, I think, um, I think the problem with that, Ryan, is that like, we don't really know what is the good question. What are, you know, what are the good questions and what, you know what I mean? And what happens now, basically, if you're watching, you know, one side of media, and this isn't just for wrestling. This is just, I mean, this is really for anything. Both sides are critiquing the other side and saying that it's ridiculous and it's or fake news or whatever you want to call it. Um, And so it's like, okay, well, which, which one, if they're both, if everything's fake news, what's real, because, you know, it's just so easy to dismiss something and cancel something for whatever you want now. And I think I, you know, I think what what about like a meteor? Not like a big one to destroy the whole world, but like like a, a solid thirty five percent of the population to where like you know like it's like EMP and we lose all this stuff. Like no, you think I feel like that's a solid <laughs> answer to kind of start from scratch again. Thoughts or an alien invasion? You know the aliens. That's- at this point i don't think an alien invasion would do i th- I feel like we would have a group of people who are like well we should you know we should blah 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 and then other group of people would be like kill them this and that and then we'd be divided on that i think that's how smart the aliens are well yeah well if the aliens are smart they're never going to come down here and mess with us because like that's just like a hot cluster that's a shit storm <laughs> we're not messing with that i think the only time we're going to see it is you know we start nuking everybody the aliens would be like whoa 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 guys Y'all are stupid, but this is dangerous. We might need to use this planet a couple thousand years from now. We don't want y'all to mess it up. I feel like that's the only reason why they would come down here at this point. Let's hope not. They're they're not going to be wrestling fans. They're going to wonder what the hell is this. I know these guys are wearing these guys wearing no protection, and they're 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 doing what in the ring? (laughs) I I, no, I think Earth is WWE for aliens. I think they watch us. They're like, this is ridiculous, but it's entertaining. Like, I think that's the way that aliens watch us. The mojo world, okay? Mojoverse. There's your snippet for the podcast today, Ryan. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Put that on Alien Invasion. Uh, (laughs) We might as well put it under uh, the Watchmen segment right Uh, there. But the the Watchmen concept would work. Yeah. There, there, there's a, there's a strange irony to this where we have a legitimate sports journalist and we've gone, we've divulged, divested into the conspiracy theory and sci-fi and fantasy. Oh, what a delight. Well, hey, it's not a conspiracy. I mean, they've literally released that we have, you know, unidentified objects that the freaking Pentagon's done that. So it's like, that's a, that's a messed up thing is they literally released like, yeah, there's stuff from other planets that we have that we don't know what it is. And it didn't even make the main news. Like everybody's more worried about what Drake's doing. You know what I mean? Like there's a nod to your journalism issues there, Greg. 
Well, and and I, Toronto too, because Drake's a homeboy, of course. Yeah, yeah. So. Oh, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I love yeah, how you yeah. mentioned Drake because he's from Toronto. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. here's the thing: if, if Drake's a big thing with Toronto, like, well, how's everybody reacting up the the AI Drake song that came out with him in the weekend that was totally AI driven? I don't know. I'd have to ask my son. He's a little more hip okay. than I am. But I, uh, that, I, heard that I just know it, they've been complaining about uh, ticket prices here because he's playing the the big arena here. Okay. Taylor Swift's here this weekend. I'll tell you what. That's a uh, gosh, Jesus. man. Well, like three or four sold out shows back to back. She's got three shows: Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they've at all sold Benz. out at Mercedes. Seventy thousand plus fans at each show. J- just just simple math. If a ticket, if the average ticket price is five hundred dollars, she's making three point five million dollars per show. So we can tie that all back into wrestling here, though. Yes, please. Go. Please. Please. That's bigger um, than WrestleMania. <laughs> well, exactly. But uh, so the one book I did is uh, called Map Memories, which I did with John Arezzi, who had this crazy ass life where he, you know, grew up a wrestling fan and a baseball fan. And he did like, you know, wrestling, early wrestling media stuff, right? He was a newspaper or a radio guy. And then he jumped in the baseball. And that's where he comes into the John Gibbons meets John Gibbons and JP Ricciardi. And then he gets into country music. And so he discovers Patty Loveless. And then, you know, 20 years later, he discovers Kelsey Ballerini. But along the way, he met like a 12 year old Taylor Swift who is handing out CDs, um, you know, and, and didn't sign, them at the t- sign her at the time. But it shows there are two things I learned about that was that Taylor Swift was always very driven to do what she wanted to do. And her daddy had money which meant that they could support doing this because so many people come to Nashville that don't have that support system. And that was partly how Arezzi explained to me that, that she made it. So he was John Alexander when he was in Nashville as you a need both. executive. You need both. So, you need the talent and the money for sure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So you need the backer. That, that is, really- that is wildly interesting. I love but how you can't, you, you can't just have the backer because look at Hulk Hogan's daughter, right? They they, they put a lot into Brooke Hogan and that never really went anywhere. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. But that was a bit of a messed up family done too. Yeah. But I think just, I think the things that happened with her brother Nick probably probably uh, derailed some things. Yeah. Derailed some things. Oh, possibly, yeah. yeah. Well, just the, just the the fallout after uh, you know the show that they had and everything else too was just mm. yeah. was a little bit a little bit too real for reality tv there but um i'll tell you what i've been to hogan's hey on it's really nice down there in, in clearwater and they're, they're, they do the karaoke every monday it's fantastic <laughs> but that's one of those fun interviews i did like he was up here i don't know probably a decade ago for a show in Brantford, ontario and and like i just went up and he was I just stuck the microphone in his, his face and asked him all those questions I wanted to do. Tell me about how a hero exists. You know, how how does a baby face react? And that became the basis of our heroes and icons thing. And I remember at one point, he just sort of looks at me and he goes, you know, these are really good questions. They're not ones I get asked all the time. Like that's, that's awesome. when you've really done your job as mm, a journalist. That's, that's the best can. compliment you can get as a journalist. Absolutely. And there's, there's momentous moments that I really to this day, I still get chills and it's not always wrestling related, right? Like Timothy Zahn is a sci-fi writer and Ralph Bakshi was a animator, right? And did um, all kinds of stuff, including the first Lord of the Rings movie. And so to interview those kind of guys, and then when they, you do so much legwork getting ready for it, that they thank you afterwards. Like that's the ultimate compliment for me. Well, we are very thankful that you took the time today to speak with us uh this was incredibly insightful and i am i am i think i speak for the boys when i say we we feel richer and more privileged to yeah, you know, learn blast. about learn about you and, and the industry and, and the history of the industry it's pretty pretty fantastic so thank you <laughs> we scratched the surface yeah no oh, yeah well yeah speaker greg i do have an, a very important correct what's your favorite color <laughs> uh blue that's cool Dabba dee, dabba die nice that's cool yeah. well, uh greg greg um how can um uh, how can the uh the listeners of our podcast um find out more information about you your website your socials etc I uh, thanks uh yeah so slam wrestling.net uh is our our website um it's been around forever uh my personal website is called oliverbooks.ca 
And there you can learn all about my books. Um, there's links to my socials there. Uh, I have vintage iron-ons from the 1970s that people can buy. Uh, they're really amazingly unique. Uh, I did, you know, kids' books. I've done all kinds of different stuff over the years. Uh, and there's more to come. It's just I'm not really at liberty to announce everything yet, but there's always work going on. And uh, it's really a lot of fun. I feel very privileged to get to do what I get to do. Right on. Well, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes. So if you're listening, check it out in the info. Awesome. Awesome. Was there anything else, guys? Y'all think of something? I mean, I, I could probably sit here and, and and pick his brain for another three hours, but oh, I know same. we all have lives that we have to get you back know, to. I, I, do, I do have one last question. I do have one last question. You talked about your son, Quinn, earlier, and um, you guys wrote a book together in 2015, uh, Duck with the Puck. Um, how what, what was that experience like, being able to write a book with your son? I mean, that's got to be cool as shit, right? It was pretty great so the the genesis of it though was he was coming to me to the hockey card shows where i was selling books or wherever it may be so he didn't have anything to sell so instead he'd be off wandering spending my money that i was trying to make right he'd come <laughs> back he actually bought like an atlanta flames puck at one point nice yeah, yeah, yeah. why do we need an atlanta flames puck um this is awesome so there that was sort of the genesis of it so we just started talking and and came up with the idea of writing about one of his favorite stuffed animals big ducky and that became a project that we worked on together and and you know he's coming up with the ideas and i help him write it but then he was fully a par part of the process our our illustrator was down in california and the first drawing she did um had it holding the hockey stick more like a golf club instead of a hockey stick right it's your slightly different place where you put your hands or your wings exactly so we we had to fix a couple of those things but the best parts was just the afterwards right it's like you're out there selling the book with your kid you're on like national tv or um on the radio we did uh, nhl sirius xm and uh, one of nice. the points he was on there and he they, he revealed he was a Florida Panthers fan because of uh, Roberto Luongo, and of course the Panthers. Okay. Lost, right. And uh, he goes, um, he just drops this line out of nowhere that shows showed me at that point he's like eight years old that he's going to be okay. He just dropped this line. He goes, "Believe in Bobby Lou," and that was and the the host just lost it. Like it was just such a beautiful moment. Um, the kids going places, and it was nice to be able. To, you know, be a part of that and, and do father-son bonding that way. How fantastic. What a great spot to end on, man. Hell yeah, man. I'm so glad I'm so glad I got to ask that question. That's too fun. <laughs> that's something that's something that's something that you, you that 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 might be one of those core memories right there. That's that's a big time core memory for you for him. You know, absolutely. Man. Yeah. And, and but it's just, it's all those things, right? Everything adds up in your life and and you wouldn't have gotten to that point if you hadn't done this and, and all those kind of things. I mean, as surreal as, oh, let's take, so I took Quinn out of school one day. Let's go meet Bobby Orr, you know, because he was going to be down at, at the Hockey Hall of Fame at an event that we got an invitation. A hockey legend, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> exactly. Number but then four, we get Bobby down Orr. there, and Ferguson Jenkins was there, who's in the Cooperstown, the Baseball Hall of Fame, and he's he was the first Canadian inducted in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And... Uh, I needed him for another book. So I quickly got five minutes from him. And then I come back later and my dad is talking to him about farming because they grew up near each other. So these are all those surreal things we talked about earlier that you can't predict how your life's going to go. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, another little bit of trivia. Cougars town is also what we call Alpharetta, Georgia here up where we're at. <laughs> Anyways. So. Oh, okay. Well, Greg, you've, 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 you've done it all. You've, you've seen some wonderful things you've done some incredible things i mean what a what a what a treasure and a wealth of knowledge you are and and once again thank you so much for taking the time to be on our podcast today our little tiny little measly podcast um it's going I, big now i really no we're big now yeah we, we're big, big time, time now. <laughs> big time journalists yeah hell yeah we got we got a we got a trying to be yeah so, asking the hard you. questions like yeah. what's your favorite color <laughs> right well, thank you so much for all your information. Thank you again for your time. Uh, guys, we are on Spotify. We are on Apple uh, Podcasts. We are on Amazon Podcasts. And we are on Instagram at Better Than Broadway. Website coming soon for the Nighthawks, for Chef, for Metsy. I am Coach Rob. 
happy wrestling everybody thank you thank you thank you hit the music Thank <laughs> you.